Some 2,500 years ago in India, a man was born named Siddhartha. At the age of 35, he awoke with the dawn and realized the wisdom he had been searching for had never been lost. He became known as Buddha, the Awakened One. The Buddha said this enlightenment could be realized in one lifetime or over many. It was the birthright of every human being, but to perfect it, you need a teacher. thousand lives? I don't remember them. I only know in this lifetime, for reasons unknown, I landed in Cleveland. My nose was smushed to one side and my new parents watched with distress as a plastic surgeon tweaked it straight. Yes, there it was from the moment of birth, the first thing the Buddha taught the truth of suffering. It was the background noise amidst moments of happiness or distraction. It was always there. An anxiety born from the struggle against change, impermanence, not getting what you wanted, getting what you didn't want. As a child, I would escape to tales of magic and foreign lands. I longed to meet an extraordinary teacher for a Merlin who would show me how to pull the sword from the stone. Would I have felt better or worse if I had known another 25 years would pass before I stumbled upon someone who held a strange attraction? Was this my perfect teacher? I think they should score more. Just something for this film crew to shoot. Usually it's answering machine, so you leave a message with your number. All right. Okay. My name is Christian. Christian. Okay. Christian. So. Bye. 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 See you. That's what happens when you travel with this. Endless. What do you think? It's your job. What is my job? My job, theoretically, Dangerous, isn't it? My job is supposed to help sentient beings. And at times, I hate this 
Not, not job, my profession. I hate my profession. There's so much hypocrisy, pretense, so much cultural hang-ups. Uh, I wish I'm just an ordinary person. I didn't know much about him. I only knew his background was not ordinary. Zangsar Jamyang Kensei Norbu was born into an illustrious family of Buddhist teachers. Okay, it was kind of like being born into a family of wizards. They were intellectually brilliant, great artists, heroically kind, and awake. In the 1950s, the Chinese invasion of Tibet turned them into refugees. Unlike other refugees, Rinpoche's relatives were not diminished by the sorrow and horrors of the invasion. They fled to Bhutan, a small benevolent country north of India, where, if anything, they shone more brightly. I often wondered how this was possible. At age seven, he was recognized as the third incarnation of Jamyang Kensei Wangpo, one of the most admired Buddhist teachers of the last two centuries, and became a Rinpoche, or precious jewel, himself. But aside from this illustrious lineage, who was he? What happened? Well, somebody jumped off the bus. Yeah? It's so typical, you know? We're trying to Can follow you, you just jump off a bus. <laughs> it just draws people into it. Even now, you know, this, this short time that we're here in London, I don't want to be a minute away from him, you know? Like, you're afraid you're going to miss something or something like that. <laughs> See, I have an assistant who doesn't know what's the meaning of cooking. Well, it seems that the art of bossing around, you've really mastered, Remy Chay, no? That I must. Yeah? Yes. Okay. After you peel off the skin, I'll lick out the, the sick. Take more and put it here instead of because is sometimes it, it starts. I see, I see. A little bit is okay. okay. So why why do you have to have a special plate, special fork? Because I don't uh, trust with people like you <laughs> who has syphilis. What syphilis is it? <laughs> A few years ago, I asked Rinpoche if I could make a film about him. I thought it would be a way to get to know him, and he thought I was joking. You're just eating vegetables? Well, I'm supposed to go on a diet. Yeah, you look a little bit chubby. Yeah, you look a little bit chubby. Only when the money came together did he then decide to do a divination practice called Mo to see if the film was worth doing. According to him, the Mo predicted barely enough grass to feed a goat for half a day. Hmm? He was the perfect mirror. All my fears and weaknesses beamed back at me from his smiling face. Have you ever thought like what I think? I, you know, for me, I think, is this girl going to reject me? You know, the whole paranoia, ordinary paranoia that all the other people have, I have too. Rinpoche teaches a form of Buddhism which appeared in Tibet in the 8th century. Vajrayana Buddhism came from India and was introduced by a man called Padmasambhava. Padmasambhava used all means necessary to help students awake to their own inner wisdom and compassion and then push them further to develop the skillful means to help others. Buddhism does not believe in a god or savior. Every step toward enlightenment you have to take yourself. So the most important reference point a student has is a teacher who points the way.
It took me years to bump into Rinpoche, and when I did, he wasn't exactly encouraging. What is your aim? What is your goal? Your goal is supposedly to see all the worldly value is, has no value. Now, in, if you have that kind of view and if you have that kind of aim, then a teacher, a genuine teacher who breaks all this pride, crushes your pride, makes this worldly life completely miserable, it's something that you ask for. He has to be the mirror to see yourself. But he's also the assassin. He's the man or the woman whom you have hired to completely dismantle you. So there it was. I would be making a film about him, knowing he would use the whole process to show me things about myself. Things which stood in the way of realizing the wisdom I longed for and happiness. We opened the refrigerator door at 10 o'clock at night, looking inside, looking, what are we looking for? What, what is it really that we want? There may be a piece of cheesecake, but really we want happiness. And we're looking in the refrigerator. Well, guess what, you know? Happiness cannot be found in the refrigerator. It's just not there. But, you know, I mean, it's obvious, but at the same time, we do this, isn't it? We're just looking with this look of, I want, I want something. Not understanding the, the whole mechanism, the whole sort of um, process of how we achieve happiness. Fortunately, two other people interested in the assassin agreed to travel with me as I made this film. When my courage failed, I had theirs to fall back on. I became Rinpoche's right-hand man overnight like that. I was his secretary, I was his attendant, I was living right here, I was answering the phone when Bertolucci called or, or when some princes of, of, of Bhutan called. All of a sudden, you know, it was kind of like I was, I was right in the center of, of everything. And that lasted for about six months. And then when he left, the whole thing just dropped like into nothing. I didn't hear from Rinpoche for, for I think more than a year. I trying to contact him, he'd ignore me. <laughs> yes, this is a very good question. Does he like me? He would just torture me. I mean, really, really. And he's good, you know. I mean, let me tell you. He, he's so good. I mean, he knows. He, he sees you one second. He knows what your buttons are, how to push them. And he's so bloody good at it. Many of us who has this guru's job, we are quite sophisticated when it comes to this. We know how to conceal the inner agenda. <laughs> and for years and years, I could tell you, I'm only interested in your enlightenment, and you would never know. Just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. If it's anyone else in life, if someone rejects you, you can just walk away and never have to deal with them again and never have to deal with your rejection. But when it's someone you want to follow for the rest of your lifetimes, you have to go through the rejection, don't you? You have to deal with it. You can't think, oh, I'll get another one then. You can't. No, no, you don't Sorry. <laughs> I hope you don't film this bit. You better not show this bit, because now I look really bored. <laughs> and I look like I've got the most piss-boring life. <laughs> and I don't have a piss-boring life. Worry. You've got to shoot the bits where I'm looking really, really intrigued by my washing. I was just like an adult as a kid. And I was quite eccentric. And I always had an interest in ghosts and uh, Ouija boards and things like that. So. Um, from all my interests as a kid, I'm now a tarot reader. I do that freelance, that's my work. Someone told me they were gonna take me to see a fantastic teacher in London. See you, Maud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I just thought he was a monk, actually, in robes. And then the following week, I was working at the cinema, and he just walked in in a baseball cap and a leather jacket, <laughs> and he came to see a film. I was really shocked, and I thought, I can't go home, I have to speak to him. When I first met him, I had to phone him up several times, and that was the hardest thing I've ever done, actually speaking into the answer machine, and because I, I didn't have a lot of confidence, really. Today, um, they shot me in the laundrette. <laughs> Which is really glamorous. You're meant to see oh, him know, as this cool. great, great being. And then on another level, you could think this is just all my imagination. So you end up chasing your tail. And it's just very funny. It's like being in the, a bizarre kind of comedy. Isn't it? It is, isn't it? It's just bizarre. I had yet to figure out how you made a documentary with somebody you were supposed to be viewing as omniscient. It's about teachers, right? No, no, it's about you. <laughs> I'm just the catalyst. I'm the one who carries the thread. That's how you should be. You should do it. Throw in a lot of teachers, but I appear at times. When my students say that I'm omniscient, I don't think they realize what they are really saying. What they are really saying is that I have a very curious look in my face. If you educate yourself, develop this some notion that, oh, the other guy is omniscient, you will always be afraid of me. Um, you're going to be tested, I feel. <laughs> I feel you, you are going to be tested. The money situation could be, again, there could be a bit of an obstacle. I think there are just elements around the documentary that could kind of stall you. The game starts 8.45 or 8.30, something like that. But the uh, actual TV starts with 7.30, the warm-up. Really? Oh, yeah, well, of course. But that, I, I can't miss that. Rinpoche decided to go to Munich to watch a qualifying match between England and Germany for the World Cup. He invited us to tag along, and despite all this hope and fear stuff, we went. Hi, Leslie. I'm just leaving a message to let you know that we just lost $40,000 of funding. Uh, why don't you get back to me? Thanks. Hi, it's me again. I still can't confirm you've got tickets to the game, but we're working on it. Hi, Leslie. You're not going to believe this, but Rinpoche wonders if you still want to come to Munich. <laughs> if I hadn't been so frazzled, this would have been a good point to reconsider what I was getting into. When you come, I'm feeling better. Sky is blue, you said forever. Oh, oh, I've been dropped by love. Then you go, so change the weather. Sky is gray. Right like it wouldn't surprise me if it just takes a different flight just to set everybody off. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> After some comment about finding a washroom, he vanished. So you can, you can kind of, you know, scrap out that option where, oh, he's just, you know, stuck somewhere and doesn't know how to get in touch with you. I mean, he does know, and he can. He's just really deliberately not calling you. <laughs> sitting here for three hours. My goodness. Why does he get away with this? It all depends on the view. Without the view, 
You know, you look at the outward appearance of what, what is it, how is the disciple teacher relationship? It's of course, it's um, psychotic, you know? You know, I mean, if he's enlightened, why doesn't he fucking act like an enlightened being, you know? I mean, that's, that's a reasonable question, isn't it? I mean, why doesn't he act? But how does an enlightened being act? Well, that's the $64,000 question. When you don't have obsession, when you don't have hang up, when you don't have inhibition, when you are not afraid that you will be breaking a certain rules, when you are not afraid that you will not fulfill somebody's expectations, what more enlightenment do you want? <laughs> That's it. Let's take this as past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. So, the four My swords. auntie Shirley, she is the teacher for integrity in my life. You know, whenever I kind of say, oh, I'm going to do this, 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 she'll sit there and go, yeah, but what about your integrity? So I didn't meet Louise until she was about 10, 11, something like that. She was a scruffy child. <laughs> You see that Louise wanted more. Yeah, there was kind of like a hunger to Louise, you know, from very, very young. Yeah. After her mother died, I think when something as traumatic as that happens, you become very fragmented. Well, my mum just got cancer and it took a year for her to die, actually. I think she'd love my circle of friends. I think she'd like Rinpoche, but I don't think she would have really um, been very accepting of me changing my religion. My life was such a mess. On a superficial level, my friends would say, no, it wasn't. You've always had a job. You've always been happy. But I wasn't. I was miserable, actually. I was manic. Yeah. Sorry, do we wake you up? Yeah, I'll sit in here alone. You like it in here alone? Well, I'm the Virgil, you see, so... Oh, you're the Virgil? Yeah. This is the Virgil. What's your name? Oh, it doesn't matter what my name is, does it? Mr... No, it doesn't, really. No. But it's nice meeting you. I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, and. Right. For letting us into the church, and the same to you. Thank you. Thank her, really. Yeah. She's... I love Shirley very much, and I often think about when she's going to, you know, pop her clogs. Thank you, anyone. All right. Bye. 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 And you know, everything she's ever told me is exactly what Rinpoche tells me. It's so funny. Of course. Just when we'd finally given up on Rinpoche, he called us. His friends told me he had mistakenly checked into the Wong Hotel. This seemed slightly suspicious, but I also felt guilty oh. for doubting him. Yeah, I should have gone to downtown. Yeah, wow. it's actually almost where we, um, where we lunch. Really? Where the hooligans are? Oh, yeah. Excellent. We have to talk football, you know? Yeah, yeah, this is important. Yeah. All you heathens. <laughs> what did he say? Just. These are the believers. <laughs> these. What, what, what these, is the these are heathens. <laughs> Three to one for Germany. In your dreams. <laughs> At least two to one. Yeah? Okay. You should really shoot some of the hooligan scene tomorrow. Somebody was saying they, they, they added an extra 8,000 uh, policemen or something like that from all over Germany, just for this, you know, to keep the quiet and the peace. 8,000 policemen. But too much of a crowd. It's going to be deafening. From our hotel, we could see the stadium, an enormous black hole, patiently waiting for 70,000 fans. As for the hooligans, I fell asleep believing Rinpoche would never go anywhere near them.
Buddhism is really concerned with how things are, and it's, just, it's really the study of things, phenomena. And in that sense, it's not very different from science, which tries to find out how things are. Hey, get, get a photo. How things really are, as opposed to how they appear. Phenomena is not limited to being in church or being in a temple or wearing monks' robes or something like that. But there, you know, it also means, well, what happens to our minds when we're in a strip joint? What happens to our minds when we're in a football game? They're very drunk. Obviously, soccer is a game, you know. We're supposed to play it. We're supposed to enjoy it. If it becomes serious, like for the hooligans, then the problem is obviously not the game. The problem is believing one's own thoughts. And that's when it becomes dangerous. To make sure we got the point, Rinpoche thought we should attend a little debate. for Rinpoche to offer some profound insight. But he was practically dancing along in his matching sweatshirt and sneakers, anticipating the game. I felt a slight irritation at how happy he looked. Meanwhile, filming was tightly controlled and we still didn't know if we could bring our camera into the game. The odds were against it. Rinpoche offered to carry a video camera in his bag, but there were security checkpoints at all the entrances and everyone was being searched. But the weirdest moment was yet to come. Our cinematographer just walked through the gates with the film camera. Because we were invited by Rinpoche didn't mean we were sitting with Rinpoche. But then he was there to watch soccer and he knew we were there to watch him. And if we couldn't watch him, we could always watch our minds. As thoughts come up, just look at them. They arise, they're temporarily present, and then they cease. Don't hold on to them, don't push them away. Just be right on the spot and look at what comes up. And every time you start to drift, snap back to the present.
from the bookies to the hooligans, New England would be walloped. But it just didn't happen. The Independent Observer said it best. England achieved one of the least believable results in international football history when they beat Germany 5-1. to one. It's basically our expectations that are not being met. You know, there is never um, um, one instant that Rinpoche is not teaching something, if you're willing to view it as such. The first thing that happens in the beginning of the second half is three miles. I like teaching my students in many different situations. In a garden, in the bar, in a toilet, I think in a modern way, and I'm quite proud of doing that. This is a different time. We have to talk differently, we have to communicate with the people in a different way. The next day, bright and cheery, we were back at the airport with Rinpoche. Following him around like bedazzled ducklings, endlessly fascinated. Imagine seeing Yoda go through a security detector. Buy magazines. Assume his magical flying hat. What's wrong with this? You're such a poser. <laughs> Rinpoche's students seem to be, you know, very much spread out everywhere. He has students in Europe, he has students in Southeast Asia, he has students in South Asia, he has students in uh, Iran and in you know, North America. And most of his students, I don't, I don't know who they are. I've, I've never seen them, I don't know, I've never heard them. The Buddha is not bound by time and space. Rinpoche is not only omniscient, He's omnipresent. He has an international teaching schedule from Halifax to Hong Kong, monasteries in Tibet, India, and Bhutan, several international foundations dedicated to compassionate activity. He has multiple cell phones, multiple email aliases, and multiple producers because he's also a filmmaker. Everyone has a path to follow. For some, the goal is enlightenment. For others, their goal is a goal. The Cup. Rinpoche was now on his way to London to start work on his second film with the help of Jeremy Thomas and Bernardo Bertolucci. His big wish was to raise enough money so that he could return to Bhutan and make a film about the place that had given his family shelter. You are a student, you are a student of Rinpoche, right? Mm -hmm. And you are using me to know secrets that uh, no students are allowed to know. And I have to be very careful in what I'm saying. <laughs> Rinpoche had been Bertolucci's consultant during the making of Little Buddha. I invited him to come where we were writing the film, and then he was there more or less for the whole shoot. Probably he was watching the process of making a movie, watching me directing, watching the actors playing, watching... I think I read somewhere that movie set are like uh, Ego's Battlefield, right? Right? And um, so he likes to be in this battlefield. Yeah. But what would happen if Buddha is there in the audience? Mm -hmm. What would she? What would he see her? And there was a rape party in Seattle at the end of the shooting there, and I said, "What do you think?" He said, "Oh, it's finished. It's a bit sad." And I'm thinking now, um, I will go to my monastery in Bhutan, and I will have at least three, four months. And I will be alone in my room, I will chant, I will meditate. They will put the food outside. It would be a, a total retreat. Uh, I said, but you don't even speak to the people bringing the food. No, no. I said, no, I, 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 I won't hear the sound of my voice. And um, I said, ah, so after all, 
this mundane period, uh, the time of renunciation has begun. And he thought a moment, he said, yeah. Then he said, wouldn't the ultimate renunciation be the renunciation of the renunciation? Which was, I think, absolutely brilliant. Because renunciation means to give up everything. The renunciation of the renunciation <laughs> means to give up the giving up, so to be able to embrace everything. <laughs> Extraordinary. I saw a filmmaker coming out from the cocoon of the, of the Lama. Some people ask me, you are a Rinpoche, you are a Lama, why you make film? Well, my answer is, thousand years ago, Rinpoches like me, they used to paint thangkas. Those were another way to express wisdom and compassion of the Buddha. Here, I'm doing the same thing, but in, in the up-to-date modern technology. This is my bedroom, and this is my second bedroom. All your altars, you know, all the yeah. movie theaters. <laughs> okay, so what I will do is, maybe you can shoot from here, I don't know, up to you guys. But I'll walk from there, okay? On one of the days I was feeling Sorry, most schizophrenic about my relationship with Rinpoche, he took me to see Matrix. As in Little Buddha, Keanu Reeves plays a man who chooses to become awake. Whoa. Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? You could say Matrix is premised on the very issues a student of Buddhism struggles with. What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? How to see through projections about people and phenomena, how to see things not as they appear, but as they are. Welcome to the real world. Your own nature of mind is radiant, enlightened, and uncontrived. But uh, because we don't know that, because we are so caught up with all kinds of hang-ups and inhibitions and all that, then we lose that radiance. So we get depressed, emotional, aggressive, all of this. Ideally, we should understand that these are all our imagination, so that slowly we build this confidence to walk out of it. It's a beautiful thing to see one's heart open up. The mind expands beyond like a spill from a cup. At this point, we had to return home, which was quite frustrating. All this talk about my inner nature being radiant and enlightened. Well, easy to say, hard to do. And trying to talk with him about it? Forget it. Was it him? Was it me? If only he were more normal. If I was beautiful like you We want our teacher slightly human being. We want him to like what we like. We want him to dislike what we dislike. We want to share things. So this shows there is a certain element that we want him to be not that special. And at the same time, he, he has to be slightly special too. So that's, that's a big difficulty there. If I was beautiful We returned to North America on September 10th, and we woke up 
on September 11th. When Buddhists talk about suffering, we are not talking about a pain. We are talking about change, the uncertainty. See, when people talk about suffering, they are talking about like a gross pain, like a headache or depression or something. That's that's like already like too late, you know. That's like only after aftermath. But in every level there is a change. Everything is changing and everything is uncertain. And that is suffering. It was at this point Rinpoche made us an offer. He was leaving for Bhutan in October, and if we wanted to, we could meet him there. It was the perfect invitation, at the perfectly wrong time to travel. I didn't want to want you, but I've got no choice. It's too late to listen to that warning voice. All I hear is thunder where our two hearts meet, doing 90 miles an hour down a dead end street. Every road to Bhutan meant a journey through the trigger happy heart of the universe. Pakistan has accused India of escalating the exchange of shellfire in Kashmir. Relations have deteriorated ever since both countries carried out nuclear tests in May. Pakistan claims that last week they nearly came to war with India. At Friday prayers, there were special thanks to Allah for the bomb. The stakes had gone up, from the aggression of soccer hooligans to the brutality of armies. In a way, the war was like an exaggerated rendering of my own egotism. I realized none of us will have true happiness until we learn to deal with our mind, because the mind is the starting point of all suffering, entrenched views, closed hearts, and prejudice. On behalf of the film crew, I asked Rinpoche to do a mo, and his answer was this. How do you know when a straight answer is a straight answer with them? Well, you don't. I mean, that's part of the problem, isn't it? <laughs> Signs are flashing past us now. We pay no heed. Instead of slowing down the pace, we keep on picking up the speed. Disaster's getting faster every time we peak. Doing 90 miles an hour down a dead end street. Okay, right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to London Walks. After some discussion, everyone decided they were still willing to go to Bhutan. Now, this is a walk about bad behavior, scandal, notoriety, and worse, in the age of knightly chivalry, the age of the Crusades, and wherever it raises its ugly head on this walk, I'll be sure to tell you all about it. The world's out of control at the moment. It's really frightening, actually. When you're kind of just with your energy and you don't have your job and you don't have your friends to interact with, you're not on your mobile phone, you're just with yourself every day, you really do become more sensitive to what is really happening in the world. I can be walking around the shop now and I'll get a little voice saying, Louise, you're wasting your life.
I mean, the fact I meditate every morning is a miracle. And even if your mind goes all off to la-la land, you, you're aware that you're doing it, you know. There's never total bliss, is there, in the world, you know, because everybody's looking out there for some kind of sustenance, where I think you have to look inside. My father, during the war, he always say, this was his idea, that if you see the bombs, you know, they have bombs that just stop, if you see one in the sky and it's coming towards you, you don't run away from it, you run towards it so it passes over your head. And I've always thought that's a good way to live life, you know, don't run away from your problems, go to meet them. Steve, don't you think it's just much nicer than all this boring meditation? Well, it's not much difference, is there? I see. It's all boring. Yeah, she's true, isn't it? Nothing happens here, nothing happens then. Luke went home to Vancouver. This uh, research project that I'm working on currently. So basically what we're trying to do is make this guy more intelligent, add some brains to him. It's always a mind that's perceiving. It's always a mind that's experiencing. It's a mind that's elated. It's a mind that gets depressed because Rinpoche abandoned us or whatever. But it's also about a concept. Canada, I mean, you know, I'm Canadian. What is Canada? You know, is it, is it the sort of border? No, the borders change. It's not the people, because the people, you know, always the, there's new people born now than there were 100 years ago. The constitution changes, the government changes. Every single thing about Canada, about any country, changes constantly. Yet, people kill other people because they believe in the reality of this thing. That's sort of, you know, vague and, and is very clearly a concept. It's a concept like the square root of two. How many people would go to war for the square root of two, for pi? Rinpoche's grandfather, Dujum Rinpoche, he used to say, the truth is, like, you know, is so close that we can't see. It's like our eyelashes. We can't see our own eyelashes. That's why, out of a compassion, the Buddha developed all these sort of elaborate practices, because we simply can't accept the simplicity of this. October arrived. We had our plane tickets, visas, malarial pills, and power bars. And then, two days before we were supposed to leave for Bhutan... Hi, Leslie, it's me again. I hope this doesn't come as too shocking to you. Rinpoche says he won't be able to go to Bhutan until January. I couldn't believe it. And the more I tried to sort it out, the more I became convinced he had never intended to go to Bhutan in October. It had all been a big setup. I didn't exactly let go of my anger at Rinpoche, but I had a brilliant idea. Padmasambhava, the great Buddhist saint, not only brought the Vajrayana to Tibet, he also made a famous prophecy. When the iron bird flies and horses run on wheels, the Tibetan people will scatter like ants across the world, and the Dharma will come to the land of the Red Man. My brilliant idea was to go to what used to be the land of the Red Man, we had three months to kill, it was sunny and warm, I was tired of Rinpoche's games, and I wanted fresh perspective. Strangely, by running away from him, we met two people who, though unlikely, told me quite a lot about finding a teacher you can trust. On opening his eyes, he found himself with the professor and the guide. And looking around him, he saw an ocean stretching as far as the eye could see. For a moment, he thought he was back on the surface of the earth soon realized that they had reached a world within a world. Roll with it, baby, roll with it.
Within Vajrayana Buddhism exists the Toku phenomenon, where the essence of an enlightened teacher reincarnates again and again in order to benefit human beings. So trying to get some answers, we went to see Gesar Mukpo, a Toku who, in theory, had done it all before. Well, my mother's name is Diana Mukpo, and she met my father at 16 years old, who is Trigyan Trungpa Rumshe. I was recognized as the reincarnation of my father's teacher, was enthroned as Shechen Kongchul Rumshe, my father's previous guru who had died in Tibet after my father escaped to Tibet. My mother didn't want me sent off to a monastery as a child. My dad thought it would be a good idea maybe if they sent me off. My mom was like, there's no way you're sending my kid to a monastery. But even tokus have to be students before they become teachers. I've put a lot of thought into it, but I consider myself low to bad level, <laughs> you know, which is um, I don't use it for the benefit of furthering myself, which it should. It's like the typical story of the rich white girl who's unhappy because she's just got a lot of money and nothing to do. I mean, that's the sort of indulgence of like a tulku who doesn't do anything. To follow around a teacher, to work with your mind on a level where right. you're constantly at 100% awareness and attentive to your thoughts is just far too energy and time consuming for me. I'd like to take this opportunity to say I'm putting up my Toku title for sale on eBay, starting bid $25,000. It's a Sechen Kongchul, uh, Ningmapa sect from Shechen District of Kham. There's quite a nice property there. Either hit it up on eBay or email me at gaysar at websitemechanic.com. Thank you. <laughs> There's a monkey in my house. He likes to roam around. He's always banging on the walls, making folk bounce sounds. I can hear it noise, spirit it just interpret through the muscles. Come on, y'all. It's the monkey motion shuffle. If you're going to be like a world champion in an event, a sporting event, you need to be doing that all the time, practicing all the time. It's exactly the same way with a master. You start to study and you're like, hey, this is getting doubled all the time. And then plotting out just a simple chart and you're like, my God. At this rate, you know, I'm going to explode. And, um... Isn't that the point? <laughs> yeah, surely. And I, well, I'm afraid of that. <laughs> what about when your teacher, you, can, you find them, you believe it's your teacher, and they reject you, and they ignore you, and they won't talk to you, and they... Well, that's, uh, that's too easy. They leave? <laughs> you can't just expect to wake up one day and the greatest teacher in the world has come to your house. If you expect to have a great relationship with a great teacher, you need to exert yourself extremely. Meanwhile, across town, the Action Llama. He's always followed his own path. Mr. Lovebeads, you're going to have to seek high enlightenment somewhere else. Ah! Steven Seagal. I have something with a completely clear up that bruise on your forehead. What bruise? That bruise. I wanted to interview Steven Seagal. Rinpoche didn't think it was a good idea. But given my state of mind, this is exactly what we did. Seagal had been recognized as the reincarnation of Chundrag Dorje, a 17th century Buddhist teacher. We emailed him at ssrinpoche.com requesting an interview, and he said yes. Well, I mean, there are many great tukus, many great lamas who have said I'm a tuku. Uh, Padrimpoche is the one who made this uh, sort of, you know, quote-unquote official if there is such a thing or if anyone cares. When he said that, he said it in front of thousands of ordained people. That wasn't a joke. It was anything but a joke. And he made sure that everyone knew it wasn't a joke by the speech he gave after the recognition. 
Uh, Tuku could be a butcher, baker, candlestick maker. They could be anything as long as they held the right view. This is my dog. He's trying to get in. He wants to the know. The little one or the large that's one? That's the big one. He wants, to, <laughs> he wants to come in and see that I'm okay, you know? Oh, okay. He's all right. Tyson. Tyson. Mm. <laughs> Having disregarded Rinpoche's opinion, it was only later we discovered what the newspapers were saying about Seagal's life. Very strange. I think it's hard to get a true understanding of um, a master unless you get a look at sort of the more clumsy craftsman. Rather than spending 10 years in arduous training under a master, spend 10 years to find the right master. Some people think, you know, that, you know, one guru is a great guru and the other people, you know, many other people may think that he's an idiot. And one of the great, you know, marks of a great teacher is, in fact, nobody really knows for sure if he's an idiot or, or a great master. A fake on a mundane level is like a magician who's just using sleight of hand to deceive you and make you think that he's doing something else. No matter how great the saint or the guru or the mahasiddha is, they are human. And they will normally have human attributes. And I wouldn't confuse that with being an imposter or inauthentic. You should never have a sense of doubt with your teacher. If there's ever a sense of doubt with a great teacher, they pick it up and they're there giving you the sort of tools to voice your doubt. Well, students should never provoke, provoke his teacher, ever. Lesser teachers, the malicious fakes, um, sort of are only interested in cementing their greatness in your mind. Oh, me there. I forgot you told me you can't fight. So gives my religion on the beat. As a martial arts master, if I can call myself a master, and I'd rather not, but I have those accolades. When people have challenged me, uh, I've had no choice but to um, give them the response that, that sometimes would be very painful for them physically and mentally. When, when the great teachers are challenged by their students, that they enjoy that and they like that because it sort of shows that they're gaining intelligence. Those that have challenged me, that I can, and there have been thousands, that I can remember were most of the time not worthy of my teaching. They're just people who wanted to cha challenge me because of their vapidity. Great masters never write anyone off. In January, we got an email from Rinpoche. He'd arrived in Bhutan and was expecting us. My first thought was to write back, fat chance. My second thought was, if he wasn't giving up on me, was it fair for me to give up on him? It's still that trust thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like teachers can only transmit to us when we're open, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's, I mean, it's a yeah. classic, isn't it? Yeah, you have to be. It's, it's almost like it's almost like you can only really receive someone's love when you let it in. It's true, isn't it? You have to keep pursuing it because he's not the one that needs the teachings. It's you. A million roads, a million fears, a million suns, to a million years of uncertainty. I could speak a million lies, a million songs, a million rights, a million wrongs in this balance of time. But if there was a single truth, a single light, a single thought, a singular touch of grace, then following the single point, the single flame, the single haunted memory of you.
our journey to Bhutan was um, quite complicated in the beginning. Equipment got lost, which is always a nightmare for a crew. And they had been up for three nights trying to locate their luggage, and the crew had to bribe the um, Indian authorities at the airport. Rinpoche asked me to come uh, a couple of weeks earlier to Kathmandu and possibly go with him to India. I had a grand total of, I think, 36 hours with him. And then I was stranded in Kathmandu. He just uh, disappeared. He went to India by himself. He didn't want me to come. Heaven, I'm in heaven. And my heart beats so that I can hardly speak. And I seem to find the happiness I see. When we're out together, dancing cheek to cheek. Oh, heaven, I'm in heaven. The proper gap in time and space, which seemingly had been so difficult to find, opened. The obstacles dissolved like ghostly illusions, and we were in Bhutan. Look at the mountains. Oh my gosh. Look at the mountains. mountains. It's very different from London. Yeah, there's no mountain. very mountains different. in London. We are used to it in Canada. But sure. you have Harrods. You don't. That's true, we have Harrods. <laughs> and now you've completely destroyed my love of Bhutan because you just reminded me of Harrods. <laughs> Actually, if you look right at the top of that mountain, you can see a bottle of Chanel perfume with a mannequin next to it. I see. Most Bhutanese didn't have a lot of material things, but they seemed to have something a lot more valuable. It amazed me. Padmasambhava walked these hills in the 8th century, and with every step he planted the seeds of Vajrayana Buddhism. Bhutan's culture is inseparable from Buddhism, and after the Chinese invaded Tibet, Bhutan became the only Vajrayana kingdom. All of the cynical voices in my head went silent. Why? Isn't that funny? Shows how lazy I am because I don't even have a job. Yeah. I heard you want to bless the army here too. And just bless seven army camps. Do you think Osama bin Laden <laughs> blesses his army as well? Yeah, yeah. Sort of similar, isn't it? You know, yeah. two roles, very similar. <laughs> At least the people here are happy. I really hope he isn't a mirror of me in 10 years time. What? Because <laughs> I just really hope he isn't. I don't become like that in 10 years time. Hmm. Guess on you then. Me. Boom. Boom. Salam children. Yes. There's about 10 George Bush in Bhutan because I named them as George Bush. What do you think? That's what that's my job, yeah. <laughs> Giving names. Yeah. Census department comes here. This is it. This is the Vajrayana country now. Yeah. You are in the Vajrayana country. What do you think? <laughs> Everything is Vajrayana. Yeah. 
Kiringa means the Danny Dibim. George Bush and Danny Dibim. He does this on purpose. He puts people together that don't get along on purpose. He says, we want to create sparks. You know, we want to put steel and flint together so that we have sparks. My perspective of Luke is that he shocks me. The first day, he said some things to Rinpoche that really shocked me, and Rinpoche saw and he was laughing his head off. Beautiful. Oh, no, it is absolutely fabulous. These are my Thank you, mummy. <laughs> Food's really good here in Michelle. So you like putting his man, putting his food? Might as well marry here, settle. Oh no, it's dangerous. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have started any of this. Because <laughs> if, if you ask him to do something, you get Godzilla. Do you know Godzilla? Big monster, oh. huge terrifying situation. <laughs> Here we have to behave and mm. have our little pinkies up. This is so surreal, Rinpoche. In the middle of nowhere, there's this really lovely little picnic. It's really, <laughs> this is so lovely. We followed Rinpoche to a valley where he kept a small house. It sat at the feet of one of the most revered Buddhist sites in the world, a mountain cave famously known as Taksong, Tiger's Nest, where Padmasambhava did retreats. If you want to go to that place, mm. I mean, you can actually literally see, once you're in the main monastery, you can literally see the other one, three minutes walk. But you have to gamble with your life because <laughs> they put a uh, like beam. Mm. And then right on that, they just put a plank not even nailed. If you fall, you are inside those uh, pine trees right underneath, 2,000 feet. Well, what's the longest retreat you've done up there? Yeah. What? Well, I actually, once I stayed there almost nine to 10 months, hmm. studying. So, of course, we all became obsessed with making the climb to Taksang. <laughs> For me, Rinpoche is like Mount Everest. He's so elegant, and I have this piggish way of eating. I mean, food is my problem, you know. And then I watch Rinpoche eat. You know, like, we were at this weird place. We stopped in the middle of nowhere to have this meal with Rinpoche the other day, with the, the other chief of police. And he had every dish displayed. And he just kind of picked a little bit at what he wanted. But me and Luke, <laughs> me and Luke took everything, chocolate eclairs, croissants, rice, every, everything. And Rinpoche said, you don't have to eat it all. And actually, he's a very good teacher in that way, that I've never seen him have what he doesn't need. And he never says what doesn't need to be said, you know. I was born eastmost Bhutan really next to the border. A few years ago, after 30, I think, after 34 years, I went to see my home where I was born. 
and I've seen my home. Trees growing inside. Um, everything, just nothing. There's nothing. So who is this Rupert My mother. Does she look like me? Eyes. Yeah, I can see the nose. Some nose and the mouth. She looks much, much better. <clears throat> Were you very close? Were you close to your mother in Pichet? Oh, very much. Do you think you would like to have a family one day in Pichet? Or? If I meet a right person. What do you think? <laughs> which is... You can get um, some babysitter which is, <laughs> which is the sort of soul suffering of the whole human race, isn't it? The right one. Any uh, husband material here? No, none whatsoever. You're so picky. You know, that, that's your problem. What? That's why you're still I'm single. I'm picky, yeah. and you're not picky. No. Oh, yeah. Very good. He's a little yogi. <laughs> well, it comes with extra spit now. <laughs> All free. <laughs> I guess that's what the kids do on a Sunday afternoon, you know, to go to the market and play some thigh bone. I don't really know the boundaries here. Because I don't know the culture. I don't know what's completely outrageous. It's much more thin ice for me here. Nice song. I spent the first several days in Bhutan trying to convince Rinpoche to let me film him at the local cinema. He pointedly ignored my request. Finally, it dawned on me, in Bhutan, a reincarnate saint does not go to the movies. In fact, Rinpoche was pretty low-key about his location scouting and casting because he had a few other obligations as well. According to Buddhism, a student has to be like a patient, and the teacher, like myself, should be like a doctor. Patient must reveal everything openly, without any fear, without any inhibition. <laughs> 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 But here, in Bhutan, sometimes the gap between the 
patient and the doctor is so high that the ordinary citizens can't even look at him, let alone ask questions. What are you devoted to? Maybe you've got a problem here, Luke, because your devotion clearly doesn't... I think this conversation is so boring. Right? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Why, though? Why it's is it just, boring? It's just sort of repeating, you know, things you read in a book. So what do you really think? About what? Well, what do you really think of Rinpoche's capacity as a teacher to help you? Just you, not students, not us, not Alex. What is your view, that Rin what Rinpoche understands about you as Luke? Well, I'm here, I must, you know, have some sort of faith, but I don't know. From day one, I just trusted Rinpoche, which he would probably say is probably a big trap. Mm -hmm. And most people would say I'm very naive, but the minute I met him, I just trusted him totally. Can I ask you, how is your um, faith and your trust in Rinpoche different from the students of Osama bin Laden's faith in him? Well, they, they have complete faith in him. They, they're ready to die for him. Mm -hmm. They have so much devotion. So how, what's the difference? Osman bin Laden and what's movements like that well, how, how rely on keeping their people ignorant. But how That's do you determine the difference? The difference? Very different. Rinpoche, Rinpoche's whole point is to completely remove our ignorance. Osama bin Laden's point is to get people into heaven. Luke, why, why do you do Buddhist practice at all? What makes you think I do? Well, I'm kind of, okay, why do you waste your time hanging out in Bhutan? I mean, I've seen you with Amala. I mean, it's checking out the babes. Checking out the babes. Well, you haven't scored yet, have you? No. I've been trying, but, um, you know, what was I just saying? My belly is getting in the way. <laughs> I think, Luke, I just, no, I just I... think you're, you're a complete secret. I know, I just think you're a complete disguise for yourself, and really you've got a million times more devotion and faith than me. Mm -hmm. And everyone else put together, and you, you know, just hide it. You're a yogi, Luke. There's no Admit way of knowing. It. There's no way of knowing. What about the fact there seems to be a point where a student has to stand up to the teacher or, or get away from the teacher? But that is the path, you see. You are not supposed to, but we know you will do it, but you are told when you do it, you watch your mind. Whether you have any sense of <coughs> devotion or not, this is a scuba built for His Majesty's father, the king. And then... Um, I think devotion is not on the level of um, liking, disliking, you know, does he like me, do I like him, you know. That may be an entryway, that may be a gateway to devotion, but devotion ultimately doesn't have anything to do with that. You can very well hate your teacher and have devotion. This king, he was one of the greatest king. This one is the Jim Rinpoche, one of the greatest king of a master, or the last century. He was a great poet, almost 24 volumes of writings. Is your grandfather on your father's side? Yes, he's my grandfather on my father's side. One of my main master. I must say, compared to many younger lamas, how they get trained these days. Mine must be quite tough. 
I slept in a room upstairs and I was never allowed to come downstairs uh, apart from going to washroom. I had only two toys for almost nine years. Paper butterfly and a tin made small car. If I did something good, the teachers would say, of course, you are supposedly incarnate lama. You, you should do better than that. And if I don't do good, they would say, what's wrong with you? You are supposed to be an incarnation of a great master. My daily schedule is very tight. Three in the morning, I would have to start memorizing things. And breakfast it will be quite quick. And immediately we, again, I start reading the text. Somehow we used to eat lunch quite early, like around 10, and then start writing calligraphy. And then we start doing you know, the afternoon prayers. That's so long. After dinner, there's another evening prayer. And around 8 o'clock, the teachers would ask me to sleep. That's how the Tibetans trained. But um, it was also necessary in my case. I was very wild. I, can, I cannot be tamed easily. Everything became a toy for me. His Holiness Nikuchin Sirinpache's way of training me was instead of scolding, he would tell me who reported to him and what they said. No scoldings or anything like that. But now I realize this trust that he put all that time is actually like a biggest weight on my shoulder. Teaching Buddhism, I find it very difficult here in Bhutan. Let's say you have no choice but to be in this sixth realm. Where would you choose? In the hill. Right. <laughs> You're good. First of all, they're very shy. And the fact that I'm supposedly a Rinpoche, uh, respected by everyone, that doesn't help because that's make, creating a big gap. This pig, this represents ignorance. There is always a fundamental ignorance, always, ever-present sort of, whatever we do. Tibetans, they even have a saying like, if a snow line comes down to the ground too much, then the snow line will be mistaken as a dog. But also, lion's roar is totally wasted if there's nobody hearing. Um, the very reason why you roar is so that someone would get intimidated, get inspired, sort of have some ideas. If you are totally isolated, what's the point? How will we be free? How will we be free? Okay. Yeah. That's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to kill this pig first. <laughs> it's true. This symbolic pig, not a real pig. No. <laughs> so we have to meditate, we have to be kind, we have to be compassionate, we have to be you know, sympathetic to others, all kinds of things. We have to practice Dharma. Bhutan was indeed a different world. 
Today, Rinpoche was performing a ceremony to restore harmony between the cops and any criminals they'd been forced to arrest. This unlikely event had been requested by the chief of police. And then after that, we were invited to the uh, chief of police's house for dinner. I mean, now, okay, after all these years, they have this very specialty drink, which is three pounds of butter in a saucepan <laughs> with alcohol mixed in. You heat it up, and then you plop in an egg, and that's the drink. And Rinpoche was very entertaining because I think he got a bit whizzy on the booze. <laughs> The concepts like human rights, beautiful concepts like human rights, Amnesty International, they become the worst political tool. At the end of the day, they somehow become a protector of the cul uh, culprits. Mm -hmm. Many times. Mm -hmm. This is how our world works, isn't it? Like, I don't know whether O.G. Simpson actually killed his wife or not, but some people think he did and that American law protected him. This, the world is so... I love this world. What a wonderful world. <laughs> See, this is... as if I've just come from somewhere. I'm going crazy, you know, looking for caste, high and low. Wow, he's really good. Okay. Okay. Sure, Jun, Jun, yeah, Jun. Say Jun, Jun. Ah, Jun, 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 Jun. For record, a first confirmed caste. Thank you. I think you okay. As a small girl, I wanted to act in Hindi movie and dance, but <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, that was like it's, it was just a dream. So now I think my dream through Rimuchi will come true. Let's go there. Yeah. What? What kind of coffee is that? We were still lusting after that trip to Taksong. Okay. Meanwhile, Rinpoche invited us to his house. Lost in my pushy filmmaker's state of mind, I never realized until much later that his invitation was more precious. This is the only two boxes that Chen Shogodot managed to escape with. Really? Wow. Oh, really? Hmm? Those are his room shapes. Yes. Chen wow. Shogodot's boxes. That's my bathhouse. Wow. This is one of my scenes. That's going to be really cold. <laughs> Should we get Luke to go in it? <laughs> he did. Are you going to shoot in this one, in your own? No. no. In the wood, with a cloth hanging. Right. And the steam yeah. coming. And then sometimes we see Dawa's body, you know? <laughs> what do you think? It's good. Sounds sexy. Well, all the image I have intact is a story. God, it's weak. There's something 
Strategy B. Two days before our visas expired, Rinpoche announced we had permission to go to Taksung. I've been on a horse for years. of going on this pilgrimage is to remind ourselves that such beings exist not as a hero but as an example one of the greatest thing that has been said in this world was said there know the suffering abandon the cause of suffering Nostalgia can open a door to many things. This is the highest I've ever been. While we lingered at Taksung, Rinpoche went into a closed retreat. He would not emerge for another three months. Rinpoche had left us a parting gift, a trip to Kishu Monastery, where his own teacher had done many retreats. It's a very, very amazing place. It's a very amazing place. I said amazing twice now. Wow. <laughs> I felt such a longing for whatever was in this place. Rinpoche had opened a door for me, and it led to the softness of my own heart. If I could find the courage to walk through. I realized he had let me make this film to learn to trust him and to trust myself. The whole reason you go to a teacher is ironically so that one will not want. You don't want to leave the guru as a, an external savior. You want to realize your mind 
nature of your mind is the Guru. Guru is only a bridge. So ultimately, wanting something from an external source is something that we have to eliminate. And times the mysteries unfold themselves like galaxies in my head. On and on the mysteries unwind themselves, eternity still unsaid. We left Bhutan having completely forgotten Rinpoche's warnings about the trip home being difficult. That's it, Louise. Are you sad? <laughs> I'm devastated and gutted. <laughs> Our flight to Canada would take 72 hours, and when we got there, a giant snowstorm appeared over Halifax. So our plane diverted back to Toronto, where we waited through yet another night for the morning flight home. <laughs> I'll translate that for you. How wonderful it is that Siddhartha came to this earth. How wonderful it is that a simple man, Siddhartha, become enlightened. How wonderful it is that this enlightened being left us the path that led him to the enlightenment. Lastly, how wonderful it is that even he did not stay on as a mortal being. That's it. Thank you. 